Hello, and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on Andale Prieta, A Love Letter to My Family by Yasmin Ramirez. Today, we'll be joined by Yasmin herself to discuss her memoir. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Yasmin in La Casa, you made it. You're What's here up? With us. Yes, yes, yes. I have a full belly. I have a beer. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. Clipped. <laughs> no, we had uh, we enjoyed some tacos earlier, so that's always great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were so good. All right, so we all have the copy of the book. Yes, Check we it do. Out. <gasps> in the camera. Check and uh, this has been in the making in the while, huh? It has been a making in a while. Because <laughs> um. <laughs> we were all talking about. I do remember taking a class on memoir in grad school with you, with Shelly Armitage, Dr. Armitage. And uh, I feel like some snippets ended up in the book, especially the parts about the tap. Mm. Yeah. So I was just thinking about that. And uh, I know we did have some questions we wanted to ask, maybe help elucidate maybe some of the things we talked about in the previous two episodes, as well as just some, maybe some general questions we we wanted to add. So Mm. I don't know... uh, Rena took some pretty good notes on, oh on something you wanted to ask. <laughs> I do have some questions. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we'll start with a hard one. A hard one, okay. It might not be hard. Okay. <laughs> um, what was the most difficult or challenging part for you in the writing process? Difficult or challenging? Um there's, I mean, there's a couple different spots that were difficult and challenging. Obviously, writing about my grandmother's death was not. And when I say death, I mean the visiting to the funeral home. That was mm-hmm. definitely not a fun place to be. Um, but it was also, in a way, a little therapeutic to go through that and write it down. Um, I think maybe the hardest thing was being self-reflective in some of the spots in that this required a ton of self-reflection, not just on my grandmother's life, but my own life. And then looking at yourself and thinking, I was not a very nice person at this point in my life. It's always hard to admit, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. when you're like, oh, I was an asshole there. Okay. But you have to show it or else it would be inauthentic. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was definitely not hard. That was definitely hard because I have to look and like balance it. Cause then we're also like our harshest judges. Like maybe what I thought was really, really like dick was not necessarily (laughs) as bad as it was at the time. Mm. So Mm. I think it's that balance of how I saw it in my head and then trying to be objective, like detaching a little bit. Mm. That's the hard part because it is a memoir. So it's a story about your life. And so how do you detach? Does... Do the editors help you in that sense because they're reading about your story and trying to, that must be hard too, right? Because you're like, no, this is what I'm trying to say. This is what I lived. And they're like, well, maybe you should do this instead, but that's not my story. <laughs> yeah. I, I never got um, like, let's not talk about this. In fact, they pushed me to talk about more than I <laughs> wanted to. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think some of the, some of the things though, especially I can, I can think back to the, to the funeral home scene specifically, I overwrote it. Mm. And then it was, I think it was difficult for the editors. And, and that's when I was still working with Lee Bird from Cinco Puta Press. She was like, it's really beautiful. And she was just trying to tell me you overwrote it without saying that because she knew how difficult that was for me to write. Mm. And she's mm. like, you just need to pull back a little bit. So I was like too, too, too much. Mm. So then I had to go back and like edit so that it was sad, but not so sad that I'm drowning the reader. Essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that is. I feel like that's a hard balance to yeah. find as as a memoir writer or essayist. Yeah, because I mean, I as a person was drowning, right? Like I felt just really horrible there. But I can't take the reader so far down that they want to put the book down because mm-hmm. then that's mm. that defeats the purpose. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, right. And that's not what you're wanting to focus on anyway in that part of the story it doesn't seem like like you're wanting us to to see what you went through to feel what you went through but then there's a light at the end of the tunnel like here's what's happening after the fact yeah I I think that's I think you hit the nail on the head Rina in that 
I mean, we all are going to deal with loss eventually, but you do have to get through it, mm-hmm. right? You have mm-hmm. to navigate those waters. Yeah. It's universal. That um, kind of led into the other question, which was more of like a part B, you know, mm-hmm. was it hard to write about family and share so many personal details? <laughs> you know, yes and no. I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I was blessed with this, but um, I was... I really tried to look at a lot of my family really objectively, especially like my mom, my sister, like that relationship, my mom's relationship with my Etha. Um, and we do see some some things, right, when we're not like in the mix, when we see two of our family members like fighting and we can we know why they're fighting, but they don't. Mm. And so I think um, that was a little bit easier for me to pull back on and like look at the bigger picture and just see how it was two people who loved each other so much, but they didn't know how to talk to each other. And that happened a lot in my family, with my uncle, with my sister, with my mom, and even with me when I was younger, right? Mm-hmm. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. So um, that was hard, but not as hard as some of the other stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. And then I don't, I don't know. I was trying to give an accurate portrayal of them, too. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I can't look at them the way I look at them as Yasmin. I have mm-hmm. to look at them as writer Yasmin. <clears throat> So a lot of times I would think of my family as characters yeah, and that helps mm-hmm. me to sort of detach a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's true. And also, I think you do a really great job of also discussing the difficulties of working with memories and how it's imperfect. And you're trying to do the best representation, but yeah, again, it's, so I, I felt like you did a pretty great job going back that far back. Mm-hmm. And I think too, I mean, one of the things You know, when I first started writing this, I had no intention of making it a book. They were just memories I was writing down after my grandmother's passing. And I wanted to hang on to these memories. So I thought if I document them and I remember all the details, all the tactile details, then I would be able to hang on to her a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of grew from there. So I think that's also why there's some interesting details that people are like, how do you remember that? And it's because I really do. Those are the things that I hung on to as as a kid. And then into adulthood, that that just really puts me back in the spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that I mean that's and that's always such a, a powerful writing technique, right? Yeah, bringing your <laughs> bringing your reader into the senses. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, if we had a, a true sponsor, we could have people with fans <laughs> on the side fanning us. Fanning us like fanning yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, too? It's because I always get a little bit nervous, even though I know y'all. Like before, I'm like, oh, I get nervous. So not only is like when I get nervous, I get hot. And then if it's warm, it's just like compounded. So, oh. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, good. Speaking of, of family, I mean, I think a question people always ask at some point when someone releases a memoir about their life and family experiences. Any any interesting feedback so far from the peeps in your in your family? You know, mm-hmm. my family has been so kind to me. I think um, I have to be really, really did grateful. Did they read it? They did. Okay. They did. They did. <laughs> did you quiz them though? Like I didn't quiz them. Um, I didn't quiz them. Also, they knew, right? Because a lot of times I was interviewing them, trying mm. to figure out some of the stuff that I, I didn't know. Mm. Mm. You know, like the sections about like my grandma's marriages. I didn't know a lot of that stuff. So I literally had to like interview my mom. And then there's some stuff that she didn't remember. So then I had to interview my sister, right? And I had to ask her, like, what do you know about this? And she would like fill in these gaps for me. That's great. Um, so mm. they knew what I was doing. They just didn't know how I was going to shape Like, they didn't understand the shape. I'm just asking a whole bunch of questions, and they're, like, trying to answer them as best as they could. Um, And then before it came out, I talked to my sister and my mom, and I was like, hey, so you don't have to read if you don't want to. I get if you don't want to. Um, But I want you to know that you cannot tell me if there's something wrong with how I remember something. Because that's how I remember it. It's a great mm-hmm. point. And I was like, this is my memory. Mm-hmm. So you might have a different memory. Because everyone experiences a situation differently and they'll remember different parts, right? Mm-hmm. So once I said that, they were like, okay. And then, so my mom read it really quickly. Like, I, she read it in like a day. Oh, wow. Um, my sister took a lot longer. She read the first half uh, pretty quickly. And then the second half, she really struggled with like emotionally. And she was just like crying a lot. So she told me she really struggled with that. Mm. 
And my uncle read it. And it was funny because I didn't have that talk with my uncle. But my mom was like, remember, this is, these are her memories. Don't tell her anything. <laughs> <laughs> so she had the talk with him that I had with her. So a little bit of coaching involved. <laughs> yes, yeah. And then what was interesting, you know, my uncle was gone for so long when I was growing up. He was like, I don't remember this. Like, he didn't know some of the stuff that happened. So it was literally like a new story for him. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that was the interesting part. But they've been so kind. All the stuff I've written about them. Um, you know, even my mom posed for photos for, like, my public Instagram account. And I was surprised. Mm. Um, and then they gave me <laughs> photos that I could share, right? Because there's some that are just for us. Yeah. And so there's, like, a folder where they uploaded photos. Like, these are cool photos that you can share. Um so they've been really supportive. That's great. That's yeah. Happy to hear that. I know because yeah. I know, in a lot of cases, that has not happened in, in memoirs. Mm. You know, yeah. people become estranged from family or like, you're like, yeah, why did you write that about me? And oh. and it's not that you wrote anything bad about them, but it is yeah. they are personal memories, and it doesn't matter. I think. Like, it's me. Yeah, the personal yeah. part of it. Mm-hmm. It's the personal aspect yeah. of it. You mentioned uh, research, and you also at the book release, and and, and here. Um, so I, I wanted to ask though, like about your research. You mentioned so obviously you have your memories, you have, and then you went to interviews with family. Uh, did you go into like documents at all, or photographs, ar- family archives of any sort? Let someone know about that. I did, yeah. Um, so my sister really like that's where she helped me the most um, was sort of like our genealogy. Mm-hmm. Um, cause as, as it was shaping, for example, like the last chapter is probably, it is probably one of the last pieces I wrote cause I wasn't sure, or it's, I think it's like the prologue of mm-hmm. where we're from, where I go through like our family history. Mm-hmm. So we, she helped me looking up like employment records. She helped me look up immigration records. Um, cause that just like overwhelmed me a lot. Like, what? Mm-hmm. I don't know where to look. Afterwards. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and so um, she helped me a ton with that. And like she would look up census documents and she would send them to me so I could kind of match up stuff. Um, and then I also researched just like the history of El Paso. Like I didn't know, you know, that you could just take a little flatbed riverboat across, you know, with like a rope, those old timey ones that you could go back and forth and how a Sarko really helped to form the city. Like I didn't know that history of my own city. So there was research that I did there, too. Um, and how it just kept doubling in size because of this international mm. business. So, um, so yeah, I did a whole bunch of research on, on that kind of stuff. And my sister, like I said, helped me with the family stuff. And then there was one thing that didn't, it didn't make it in here. I was really bummed because it took me so long to transcribe it. Um, I interviewed my sister, but we drove around the city like in an interview. Oh, so nice. we went to different places downtown and she would tell me like, this used to be a movie theater and grandma worked here and this used to be here. Um, you know, cause we're, we're 10 years apart. So that's a big jump. Mm. And so she was giving me her memories of where she used to go with my Ita, where, what was downtown, how it changed, but it, it just didn't really fit. And then I also think there's parts like if you don't live here, I really would have lost readers because they would just mm. be like, OK, they're talking about a random building. OK, yeah. whatever. Mm. <laughs> um, so it was definitely more of a local kind of thing that I think only if you lived here would you appreciate. Mm. I do think that that sounds awesome. I think that that's great, like cool. a, like additional <laughs> content to help mm. promote the book, you know, releasing it. Mm-hmm. as like yeah. you know a DVD extras type type of deal <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The book and uh, <laughs> by the way your promotion and, and all that has just been a killer I know right? thank all you the yeah. commercials mm-hmm. and, and your event was amazing put yeah, so much so into nice. it so thank yeah. you that I, that goes a lot to to my husband he helped me a whole bunch um, on social media he's not present ever he does not want to be in any of my social media <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like he's a very I don't want to say he's a Luddite because he does have social media accounts and he does mm-hmm. use technology. He's just behind. He Yeah, he always wants to be behind. Mm-hmm. So like the release, he literally did everything. He had a map. He 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 did so like he really was just like, you just show up. Yeah. And I was like, really? OK. Um, and then the filming poor him. He had to deal with all my flubs <laughs> because it literally it would take me like five takes to say it correctly. Um, and then it would get awkward. Like when we were filming on scenic drive, you know, people are always around there. Yeah. So we're filming and then they would stop and watch us. So I'm trying to like hide and not, not look at them, even yeah. though they're right behind him. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is uncomfortable. Um, 
Yeah. So that's also weird. Having yeah. people watch you film something. Filming anything is always awkward. Talking to a camera is weird. <laughs> it's super weird. Um, but then having people watch you talk to a camera. Yeah. Like, I'm not a newscaster. <laughs> that's why I don't, I don't understand, like, the whole TikTok thing. Because pretty much every TikTok I've seen, people are doing it, like broad daylight in public spaces you know unless it's like a dance in your living room or whatever but everything else i'm like how do these people like i could never it's definitely more normalized i think uh, where a lot of people are growing up with it for us yeah it's like oh yeah it's uncomfortable it should be uncomfortable what do you think (laughs) i'm like in the middle like i want to do it but then like i get super nervous but then i see other people do it and i'm like i should be able to do this i think it's also i mean i do it now right as part of the book promo um i got better obviously doing the filming and stuff with my husband um because he he did all the photographs all the book the book trailer those initial videos that's all him um and then i was like okay well i have to keep promoting this right like you you have to think of different roles like i am the author and i wrote this book but i also have to be the promoter like i am the Mm -hmm. only one that's going to promote it as much or as hard right as i can because i i put my myself on this page and so I've just been you know trying to think of what content people want to see and mm-hmm. then I'll look at TikTok and see what other people are doing and like oh I kind of like that or I kind of like that in a way it's almost like writing and that I'm reading a whole bunch of books to figure out my own style so I'm watching a whole bunch of TikToks to figure out my own TikTok style That's true. Mm-hmm. and so in front of the camera I'm still awkward like I think I look awkward <laughs> but that's just <laughs> no you don't you look really natural doing that i mean it goes back to what you said earlier like we're our own like critics yeah yes. like, yeah yeah so now i'm just trying to have fun with it because it should be fun right mm-hmm. and so i'm trying to have fun like doing silly stuff um i think the most nerve-wracking thing i just did is i'm trying to practice my spanish and mm-hmm. filming in spanish was super hard so hard um and i have all i'm gonna release like a boop blooper reel uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, I just make the funniest faces. I'm like, la, 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 fuck. Because I'll mess up. And then you just see like the video that I'm just like, ah. Oh. Um, Do or you some... use um, achico palado? In <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't use achico palado. Was, I'm never going to forget that word. <laughs> you can look at my Instagram for that. <laughs> perfect segue. So yeah. how people follow you on Instagram? You can follow me. <laughs> on most of my social media, I'm Yasmin Ramirez Wright. That's uh, the only one that's different is Twitter, and that's Yasmin. Ram- oh, Yasmin Ram Rio. Oh, what was the other one taken? Yeah, they were, it was taken. I don't know what Yasmin took my handle. Ah. <laughs> that could be only one. I know. I'm like ah. <laughs> Goes and reports the account. <laughs> like, <laughs> inappropriate content. The person is pretending to be me. <laughs> that was good. That's crazy. That's good. Do you have any questions, Vanessa? I, I know you do. I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously I took you for creative writing, and I did see some of the same techniques that you talked to me about in your class in here, and I was kind of curious about like how you went about kind of going from like the creative aspect of it to like kind of like the memoir, like how that like, mm. process was. Um, I think they were kind of married for me, actually. Okay. Um. The whole time I did this, I was just trying to honor the story as best as I could. So it was like story, 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 like follow the story, even when it took me to some, you know, not so happy places. So I followed the story. Um, And so what I would do is I would write it out, like, here's a memory, and there would be some creative stuff in there. And then I would go back and in the editing process, I'm like, wait, this wording is weird. Or I said this word too many times or um, so there's two different like brains that I have to use in that. Okay, let's get this out. And then in the editing is where you do some more like magic, I guess. Mm. And then that's how you, at least that's how, that's what I did. That's my writing process. Um, And at first I try to get it out and then I go back and like, okay, I need to add some setting. I need to add some imagery. I need to add some scent here. Um, But it was Mm -hmm. always married for me. Like there wasn't um, like, let me think of this this way and then go back and make it a memoir. So it was very much streamlined in that way. Hmm. So you're saying like during your editing process, you went and added like more sensory, like things that you can kind of push more of an impact on on a certain scene or image. Or... Yeah, because I think, you know, when you're reading, you have like a mental movie going on. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 
And so I clearly had a mental movie because they're my memories. But I had to make sure that those memories translated for y'all as readers. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure that I highlighted um, like for people not from El Paso, that they understood certain things um, in certain areas or the way I described the mountains or um, I don't know. So they could kind of get a, the movie, the mental movie. And then if you're from here, then you really get it. Like you see streets, yeah. you see intersections because mm -hmm. um, I really wanted wanted to honor the space that sort of made me right. Like the city definitely impacted who I am and I wanted to honor that as much as possible. Yeah, Absolutely. it was definitely uh, an additional character in the story. I know mm. you you wanted yeah. that. To For sure. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, I did. Good. <laughs> that kind of leads into, Vanessa kind of already talked a little bit about it, but we were talking about this, I don't know if it was, I think it was probably episode two because that's Finding Yasmin, right? It's Finding yeah. Itha, Finding Yasmin. In Finding Yasmin, we saw that you played a lot more with genre there. So like, you had more creative pieces, like the visual. Um, now I can't remember which one it was, but when you're you're um, when finding Yasmin, there were a couple of pieces that were um, a little more fictionalized. Mm -hmm. um, so where you were playing with the genre, which is interesting, because in memoir, I mean, you do see that, but a lot of times it's just like straightforward. This is what mm -hmm. happened. These are my memories. Um, so I really enjoyed those pieces, the the church piece um, particularly, because it just kind of like um, surprised me. And I remember you talking about, before I even read the book, um, I don't know if it was at, it was at one of your talks. Um, and you were saying how you were cautious with how you were talking about the church, but you were also like, well, this is how I feel about it. And so I was expecting, you know, I don't know, like bashing, but there wasn't really any bashing. I, I think I noticed a couple of things that might, you know, to the, to the sensitive person, which let's face it is everyone right now, um, might be offended, <laughs> <laughs> offended by little things, but it, yeah. it wasn't anything. And, and it's, it's totally understandable from, a young perspective like doesn't understand the whole church going experience and, and all of that so anyway that's my uh, long-winded way of, of saying that I really enjoyed those pieces yeah. um, in part two but there was also the one in part one thank you guys for pointing it out um, where Yasmin is falling on page 93 okay yeah with the white space 92 yeah, yeah. White so, yeah, if you can talk a little bit more about the gender bending and um, why you decided to include these these pieces, I guess, in your memoir. I think, um, you know, this is one of those things where I um, I did an inter interview recently and the interviewer was like, I think it's really beautiful how you use this space to show the distance in your mother and your grandmother's relationship. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I did it. I totally meant to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I'm, I'm very smart. Um, <laughs> and you know, um, I, maybe, maybe this is where like subconsciously my brain knew better than like my conscious brain. But when I was doing this, um, I really wanted to show like how weird it was that they would scream at each other <laughs> up and down the stairs. And when I say scream, it's just so they could be heard. Mm -hmm. Right. And so imagine I'm there. I'm like a 10 year old kid in this awkward position where my mom's like, hurry the fuck up. I want to go home. <laughs> and my grandma's like, oh, your mom never wants to see me. And I'm just like, <laughs> I have to hurry up. You know, I'm like <laughs> stuck in this weird spot. In the middle, yeah. And um, <laughs> the, the stairs at my Ita's house have, are really important to me. For so many, like her house is so important to me. And uh, you can see that in the cover. <laughs> it's on the cover. Um, and so mm -hmm. I really was just playing with this idea of like their voices and that each it's and it's 25. Right. If you count the letters, it's 25 letters going down and 25 letters going up. Damn. So I was very I didn't, yeah, I didn't come conscious <laughs> of that. So it's imitating the voices coming down and up the stairs. Mm -hmm. And initially, like one of my. Um, one of my first readers, uh, y'all are familiar with him, Rich Yanez, right? He's a local writer as well. No, who did? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when he first read this, like an early, early, early draft, he's like, I would be careful, I, you know, when you're publishing a book, they really look at the space and you think of it as like real estate on the page and they might not let you do this. And I was like, mm. no, I was crushed, right? <laughs> but they did, which I love that they let me play with this. And then now yeah. there's people that are like, oh, it's the distance. And I'm like, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, when really I was just really like, it's the stairs. I want to show up the visual like stairs going up and down. And that's why I say subconsciously, I think my brain knew that it was creating this distance between the two, like visual. Because yeah. I'm not a poet by any means. I Poetry is not my strength. But I know about using space, white space, right? That's mm-hmm. a, a writing like terminology on the page to create an impact. And I wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Um, did you have another one, Vanessa? Yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to ask about, like, the editing process more mm-hmm. so. Um, because from my understanding, it was, like, pieces that you had written previously and then kind of put them together also. So I kind of wanted to know how you went about kind of meshing them all together so that they fit really well, like, the way that they came out in the book. Yeah. Um, first of all, I am a huge fan of working with editors. Um I am so grateful. I, um, you know, I, I'd submitted the I'd submitted the book to like two other uh, presses before, and I got like really really kind nos. Um, and when I say kind, like usually when they send you a no, it's like a standardized like sorry we're not feeling your work kind of email. <laughs> but I got like two really long emails with like we really love it, but it's missing this, and this is this, and I was getting, like, editorial feedback. That's helpful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Super, right? Like, I was like, oh, my God. And so I made changes, and I made changes, and I made changes. And then the last no I got, like, really hurt, because I was just like, fuck, I'm never going to finish this. Like, I just keep getting stuck. Mm. And the people who had read it knew me. So, like, Rich Young is knew me. A very good friend, Minerva Lavallega, knew me. So whether they knew it or not, I maybe have filled in the narrative for them, right? Because I tell them stories, you know, you talk, you share life experiences. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. then I'm like, I need, after I was done like moping, right? Because I was like licking my wounds. Part of the writing process, peeps. Yep. (laughs) You mope. You mope. Just don't get stuck in the mope. Yeah. Um, I think I moped for like two weeks. And then I was like, I need to figure something out. And then I thought, I need an editor who does not know me. That way they can tell me this is what's missing. And um, so I reached out to a good friend, um, Sylvia Aguilar, who's also a local writer. And then she referred me to Cinco Punto Press and they worked with like freelance editors. So they're like, Mm -hmm. "Okay, we have some names for you. And I reached out to this woman. Her name is Becky Powers and I love her. We're still in contact. Um, When we met, well, first she asked me for a writing sample which I was like, okay. I think that was like her testing, like, do I want to work with this person? Mm -hmm. And she's an older woman, you know, a grandma, just kind of like, she just likes to do a little something on the side. And so when I met her, I met her for coffee and we talked and um, we like instantly clicked and we stayed at the Starbucks for like three hours. And then she's like, okay, I'm going to read it. And then we're going to talk about it. And then within like, I want to say like a couple weeks, she was like, bam, here you go. And it was all these notes and all this stuff. Like, she's like, you're missing this and this and this and this. And I was like, oh. and I, there was some parts that I was like, I don't want to. <laughs> like, <laughs> there is some stuff like about my father that I'm like, I don't want to write about that. I don't want to mm. give him the space in my book. Mm. And she was like, he's there, whether you like it or not. Like, I yeah. know he's there because it's absent. So he's already there. Mm. And I was like, oh. it's good. It's good. yeah. Mm. So she really, really pushed me to to go further and that's where I say I'm very grateful for the editorial process and not just when I say that I mean like content development not you missed a comma here like yeah. content development in in this process was so helpful to me and I'm so grateful to Becky and her daughter Jessica um they both looked at it like I guess Becky just really liked it and she gave it to her daughter and her daughter freelances as an editor also so I yeah. got like two people looking at my work telling me <laughs> this is missing do this do that Um, And so now I'm like eternally grateful to them because they pushed me to places that I wasn't willing to go on my own. Mm. Wow, that's that's beautiful advice for a lot of our a lot of our listeners are not only readers, but also aspiring writers themselves. So Mm -hmm. I just think that was a hell of a tip, like have someone look at the work that doesn't really know you. And I Mm -hmm. think that's uh, great. The other thing is uh, a a very common piece of advice in writing is kill your darlings. So since you're talking about editing, 
Uh, so who would you kill <laughs> in who that and along the manuscript? Um, I don't know if I necessarily killed anyone. By the way, that just means like when you really love something in your writing and you just have attachment to it, sometimes it just well that Gathered that interview you had with your sister yeah there you go there yeah you go. I, I think that that's the one I can go to because mm-hmm. I don't think I really took out anything else um from mm-hmm. it but I I did there was the no I really like it but I knew it was sentimental for me mm-hmm. and not it didn't contribute to the story mm-hmm. so you really have to be like is this contributing to the story or am I just I just do I just want it there mm-hmm. right and then you also have to choose your battles like do you want this or do you want this do you want mm-hmm. this? Or do you want this? You know, like, um, I would just from stories I'd heard, I was prepared to battle about the Spanish. Mm-hmm. And um, that was one of my questions. Yeah. Uh, like, my, <laughs> you know, my grandma's voice, if they asked me to change it into English, that was like absolutely positively a firm no for yeah. me because it was not real. It would not be real at all. Mm-hmm. And then I think the writing, especially her voice, it would lose a lot of the sentido, right? Like yeah. her and her voice inflection is one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of in that I remember her speech pattern so well that mm. like when my, when my sister read it, she was like, Oh my God, it's like, this is Ita. Mm. Like I, I really nailed it. Mm. And so that was a no go for me. Like if they were like, make it in English. Um, now I knew, obviously I wrote it initially. I wrote it for me. And then I had to think of the audience and then I had to think, do I want it to just be read by a few people or a lot of people? And then for me, it was just like, I wrote it. I'm happy. It's out there. But then I put so much work into it and I share so much that I did want to reach a, a broader audience. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. putting in some context clues for readers yeah. wasn't really like that don't speak Spanish mm-hmm. um, wasn't that big of an issue. And then it was nice because I had like Becky and Jessica Powers and later Lee Bird telling me, we don't speak Spanish, so, mm. you know, give us something here. And so you can see there's different kinds of ways that I gave either a context clue. If it was a harder sentence, I would directly, like, the little girl me would be like, I don't know why Ita thought, like, translate yeah, it. We did, so we did right talk about after. that in part mm-hmm. one, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, like, you would repeat kind of what we just said to you. We're like, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oh, so yeah, the, audience. <laughs> yes. So that's where I had to think about audience, and that was also in the editorial process. So you mentioned uh, your release, Dr. Meredith Abarca. She's an awesome professor, always writes about food and culture. <laughs> so I'd li- you know, I'd definitely like to bring up how, how food plays, you know, for you, uh, a role in culture and telling our stories or keeping our stories. I think, um, you know, when I lived in Dallas, it was really interesting because I was almost like cultureless um, mm. in that, aside from my sister... You know, I didn't I didn't have any friends who spoke Spanish. I didn't really I was just in very white spaces. And I didn't notice that my my view on food changed, right? I have this very <laughs> this very crazy memory. I think Dr. Abarca almost had a heart attack. Because t- it was when I first moved back, I was still very like Dallas. And I was like, if I could just take a pill and then be be full, like that's the meal, I would do that. And I, I think she almost literally fell out of her chair <laughs> when I said that, you know, because she's just like, what? And then the longer I was home, because, um, you know, home when I would visit or when my mom would go visit me, she would bring me food. Right. Mm-hmm. She she was that lady going mm-hmm. through through the airport security with like yeah. tacos and stuff. <laughs> and then I would come back with stuff, you know, Um but I kind of forgot about that. And then moving back was truly kind of finding finding a balance of who I become while I was in Dallas and then who I really wanted to be. Um, and food was part of that. And so I think, I, I mean, I'm very grateful to Do- Dr. Abarca for reminding me of that and reminding me of food and how I associated, I mean, I knew I had associated meals with my grandma, but it made me... I don't know, reflect on them a little bit deeper. Mm. So when I think back to even myself saying, like, if I could just take a pill and be happy and full and I would just skip eating altogether, then I'm like, oh, God, who was that? Like, who's that person? (laughs) (laughs) You know? Um, And so I loved not only cooking with my grandma, not only making the meals with my grandma, um, but I love sharing meals with people. Right. It's a it's a Mm. it's a form of communication. Um, and when I was writing the, the recipes, um, Ita's tacos especially, like I've cooked them in different spaces. 
And so it's interesting because I'm bringing a piece of like not only my grandma, but like El Paso, right? Because the Mexican food in El Paso is very distinct Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. other areas. You know, there's always the eternal battle with California, (laughs) California, (laughs) Texas, border Texas. Who has better food? Because all the middle of it just. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) But it's true. But it's true. Yeah. Um, And so I think about that, like I was communicating with them certain things. And so I, I don't know. I think it's. It's ingrained in, in who we are, right? The meals, even mm-hmm. like comfort meals. Yeah. Um, we all have one when we've had a really bad day, mm-hmm. whether it be a takeout comfort meal or like, I'm going to cook this. Mm-hmm. So there's so much more to food than just it's food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember when, like, I think it was like the first day or like the second day of class with you. And you took us like pan dulce. And we had to write, we had to pick a piece of the pan dulce and like write about it. So you bribe your students? I'm gonna, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you do it. No wonder no, they keep taking uh, your class. Right? <laughs> it's all in the pan dulce. Great yeah. advertising. Take your class. I loved, I loved that. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. it's a great icebreaker, right? Because yeah. you're, you're in class, you're uncomfortable, you're all looking yeah. at each other, like, who are you? Especially um, in a creative writing class because you're like more vulnerable. In a sense, you mm-hmm. want you want them you want people to be yeah yeah so that's a great way to introduce that yeah it helps break the ice it helps put people at ease it's interesting mm-hmm. to see what they pick mm-hmm. right I had a concha in case anybody was <laughs> nice oh we should have brought that for dessert oh, I know. <laughs> oh that was nice he's like harmonizing that <laughs> The tragedy. <laughs> the tragedy. I just thought about tacos today. I didn't think I should have thought about the pan dulce because I was even asking about coffee, like coffee and pan dulce de cafecito. Mm. Which is what we had when when we had Ale here. Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like some pan dulce. Okay. Yeah. I have to br- I have to bring you guys pan dulce next time. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you earlier in this episode, you mentioned how you're not a poet, but kind of bringing in like the whole bringing in food, you know, maitas recipes. To me, like that's a very popular genre right now in a lot mm-hmm. of poetry collections, like the recipe, because it's it's more than just the recipe. You're including memories and and authorial kind of commentary about the significance of what you're doing, and I think that's mm. a really nice way to end the book. And of course, for Papagayo, we actually did went and did that a little bit. We did we uh, had you on as a guest, and you you made we made some salsa. We did, yeah, we yeah. did. <laughs> Um, you know, what's funny, the first recipe I wrote, uh, you would think I would have written more, um, was the caldillo. And mm-hmm. I think, cause they, I don't know, that's so comforting to me, the caldillo. And then the other thing is there is that I really did miss that, right? Like mm-hmm. that moment of cooking with her and doing stuff. And when you replicate the recipe, you're kind of, cause it's, I, you know, I don't, I don't usually write in second person. It just doesn't work well. Mm. And here I am literally talking to myself, like, mm-hmm. this is how you should do this. And da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I, the food, it just, it made me really nostalgic. And then Los Tacos de Ita came after. Um, and it wasn't until, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know, like, oh, this is, there's, I, I call it like a narrative recipe. That's what I started calling it. That's awesome, yeah. And then a couple summers ago, I um, did the Martha's Vineyard Institute of Writing mm. um, thing online. And I went to a session about a crab essay. And as he was talking about it, I was like, that's what I did with a recipe. Like, I was like, what? <laughs> um, so a crab essay is essentially taking any form, anything, right? It could be a list, a recipe, um, Anything that is a, a way of writing, but you make it into a story. So I I was like, oh, I didn't even know what I was doing. And I did it. I did a crab essay. Right. <laughs> so it comes from that hermit. You know how hermit crabs find their their shell. Mm-hmm. Do you know that's mm-hmm. I did, right. So hermit crabs are like in the ocean, like looking around like I need somewhere to live. And so a lot of times they find like trash, like a can and the can will become their like protective shell. Cup of ramen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Things like that. And so they'll take shells. They'll take, you know, sadly trash. But that's where the crab essay name comes from. And so when I learned that, I was like, oh, that's so cool. I was doing this. I didn't know it. (laughs) (laughs) High five, (laughs) Yasmin. Yeah, it's the metaphor that keeps on giving, right? Right, yes. Because they move laterally. So it's like some kind of lateral thinking. 
mm-hmm. moving <laughs> genres like that. Yep. And, uh, I think yeah. we talked a little bit about it um, last time, and maybe I brought it up already, but Denise Chavez's um, taco testimony. Previous episodes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she she. that's the first time I had seen it. So I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, she has stories intertwined, you know, um, in these recipes and stuff. So, yeah. I read that recently because of you, actually. I hadn't, because it was hard to find. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess there's not that many. They, they only printed a certain amount or something. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of hard for me to find it. But, yeah, it was interesting seeing that um, in that space. And then I thought it was really cool. I don't know. I think there's something beautiful in that. So people, um, Denise Chavez's work, right, with that, the story of where I imagine, like, the whole family, a couple of people have told me that it sounds like Sandra Cisneros-ish, which I'm like, oh, that's so cool, right? (laughs) And then I have to admit, I didn't read Sandra Cisneros until, like, later in life. Like, I didn't read Cisneros and then write my book. I wrote my Mm -hmm. book and then read Cisneros. And so then I think there's something beautiful that speaks to like culture in itself and that brown writers have these same methods of storytelling Mm. because of our culture, not necessarily because we're influencing each other. It's kind of this um, like universal experience in certain ways. Right. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Obviously, I'm very honored by those, like, even just being in, like, compared to a little bit to mm-hmm. either of those writers is pretty amazing. But then knowing that, like, in some way, shape, or form, that was already in me, right? It's in us to be these mm-hmm. types of storytellers and how food really impacts our culture or music really impacts our culture, right? Um, I, I just think it's really beautiful. That's really interesting because they're two very powerful, predominant, like, Chicana writers. I know you don't identify as Chicana. Right, I do not. I do but not. I'm like, this is clearly Chicano literature. <laughs> I'm Hold just going to put it out there. Gasp. Yeah, like, <gasps> <gasps> um, Okay, we don't have to talk about it. <laughs> no, we can. I, I'm, I'm surprised nobody has asked me this. That's the first mm-hmm. time. Perfect. No one's asked me this before. Exclusive. Ex- yes, yeah. Because if you look at most of the press... And obviously the press put that together, right? Mm -hmm. So it says Mexican American. Mm -hmm. Um, I like if I have to pick in my list of identifiers, right? My first is going to be Latina, and then I'll go Mexican American, and then I'll probably go Chicana if I have to. Um, With a C H or an X? (laughs) Well, I mean, I (laughs) my pro no, but my my pronouns are she her, so I'm going to take the A, right? I don't I don't need the gender neutral use i'll take it but it's not necessary oh, no, i meant at the beginning of the word not the, oh the end. oh yeah, yeah. I, I thought you were talking about that end like chica next sorry mm-hmm. no, no no um really i think it just has to do with my experience of the word chicano it was not a positive one mm-hmm. um like growing up one my mom did not like the word she was mm-hmm. like Ugh, that's like that's chusma she said like chicanos were chusma and I don't know how she experienced Chicanismo, right? I don't know. Mm-hmm. So then I had that already seed planted. Mm-hmm. And then when I did meet people who identified as Chicano, I just really did not like them very much. <laughs> right? They seemed very... That's great. That, and, and you know what? And that, that goes to show that there is a spectrum in it too, right? Because now, mm-hmm. like Reina, I know that you do identify as Chicana. And I love Reina, mm-hmm. right? And so... It's just, just those initial experiences that I had were not positive ones. So then I was like, yeah, I'm not Chicana. I don't know. I don't think I fit in that. Mm. And the other thing, the other reason I don't think I fit in that, um, and this is, again, my perception and my experiences, is a lot of times when I would meet someone who was Chicana later, or Chicano, they would talk a lot about having family in Mexico still. Or they had like a very first gen or just immigrated experience. Or they would share stories about how their family used to work in the fields. And I have zero of those stories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm very disconnected from that narrative. Mm-hmm. And that, that also made me feel like, yeah, I don't think that's me. I don't think I fit mm-hmm. in that definition of, that I've experienced. Yeah. But really the word I use more, I think, is brown. Like I'm brown. I'm very proud of my brownness. Um, 
with myself, I'll, I do it like a little with cariño. I say I'm a brownie. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But that's just for me. And, you know, with cariño, right? You talk about the title. You, you spoke about that quite a bit at your book release, right? How people, mm-hmm. how that word has a specific mm. approach. You know, people react to it. For sure. Way. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been a lot of strong reactions to the title that I felt so silly I didn't think about, you mm-hmm. know, but yeah, the title in itself is very brown, right? Uh, I, it's kind of not very common at all for a predominantly English written book mm-hmm. to have a Spanish title, mm-hmm. right? So that's why we even added the a love letter to my family, because mm-hmm. that's looking at maybe an audience member who doesn't speak Spanish. If they just saw Andale Prieta, they would think that the book was in Spanish, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, we did talk about the subtitle as well in previous episodes, so it's a great, uh, it's good to know that. That mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Again, context, you do, try and do direct translation, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, and so, you, you know, um, I, 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 I think the other thing too is with, with Chicanismo, I, I think it's beautiful in the spectrum and how people, we have options to choose how we want to identify and how we feel comfortable in certain spaces. But at the end of the day, we're all like, yeah, we're brown and we're proud. That's mm-hmm. the most important part, I think. The profoundness to the brownness. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yes. Richie right. and I practiced that. I'm going I'm I'm to reach that. I can tell. <laughs> Um, so my last question is kind of, you kind of brought up music. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of music mentioned within the book. Um, some of them you say, stop and go listen to this right now, and others you don't. And I was wondering how you kind of made the decision on which ones you had to say, stop what you're doing and go listen to this right now. Yeah. Um, so music yeah, is obviously very important in the book. It's very important to me. Um, there's the accompanying playlist on Spotify um so you can find it it's the same title as a book right um going back almost circling back to one of the first questions right of how I kept things how I remembered things and how they're very visceral so a lot of my memories were very much linked to music right especially mm-hmm. being at the tap mm-hmm. the certain songs that play at the, the tap magic jukebox yes the magic <laughs> jukebox that still play to this day <laughs> yes. yeah 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 exactly um so there's some that were just so visceral that i wanted as best as i could right to invite the reader like go listen to this while you read it because it was really important like to get that feeling um and then other ones, like later, especially like in the Finding Yasmin sections, I talk about music and its importance, but I don't know if it was as visceral mm. as those earlier memories. Because mm-hmm. um, I don't know if necessarily you need to read Nirvana, right, on the second part of the book. Mm. Like, you, it's and it's more common music, like people know it a little bit more. That's what I thought. I think that's what, yeah. what we talked about last time, right? I, I had the theory that it was because... Some of the earlier songs, like some of us might not know or be familiar with them, but also there's so much tied to that memory of you as a child with Ita that later on all the other songs like, oh, yeah, she mentions Nirvana or she mentions whatever. And like we know what that is, but it's not necessary for that memory for us to continue reading that memory to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. For sure. Yeah. But so cool. I was right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you were. Yeah, <laughs> ten bucks, pay it up. <laughs> yeah, lots of bets going. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had also mentioned it earlier, you know, talking about like the mental movie, and I think I used the word cinematic a couple times, and including mm. music is, is almost like a soundtrack to these memories. Mm. It really helps build that up as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think too. That's the that's where I am also as a writer. And then as a person, like music, like music is in my being, literally. Like I'm a horrible musician. I'm a horrible singer. <laughs> um, but I love, love music. Um, I talk about music all the time. I'm always like searching for new music. I'm always like, oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. I cross genres. The only genre I don't cross into is country. Um, just because it, I don't, I don't like it. It's all the same, <laughs> you know. And then there's pop country. That's just like, oh, um, <laughs> oh wow. <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> Man, there are a lot of shots fired I on know. today's You're episode. Lose a lot of I, like, I, have a, I have some notches running. <laughs> on the side. You know what's funny? A reader told me. Um, she she messaged me and she was like, "Oh yeah, I know you don't like country." But you should listen to this. And I was like, how does she know that I don't like country? Did I say it in the book? I'm all confused. Like, what did I put that? And it's because I said I didn't like banda. And so she's like, if you don't like banda, you don't like country. Oh. And I was like. That's what I was just thinking of. Like, I was going to mention. Interesting. Like, hmm. But that's hmm. more like Tejano. Like, I would equate those two. No, like. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I think the analogy worked because the only song that I really like that's banda is like Los Tigres del Norte, like La Puerta Negra. Mm. Who, who does not love that, <laughs> right? Um, but outside of that, I don't listen to, to banda either. Mm. Um, and I'm sorry, country lovers. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but there's, I do love two countries. There's two country songs on my playlist from Living in Dallas. Mm. Uh, uh, Friends in Low Places is a classic that you mm-hmm. cannot. I mean, just if you're a bar goer, yeah. too, uh, just like. That, and that's know? also my karaoke song. That's my go. go-to karaoke. <laughs> um, and then the Hank Williams Jr. song, like, why do you drink to get drunk? <laughs> right? That was the end of the night song. <laughs> And, and bars in Dallas. Yeah. And the whole, like, you know, here in Juarez, it would be like closing time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is. It's still so funny. Is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In Dallas, they would play Hank Williams Jr. And then everyone in the bar would be like, to get drunk. And then they would like go along with it. So, I mean, I have two country songs. It's just not my jam. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. What about mm-hmm. reggae? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and what are your gonna thoughts? Go down all the genres. <laughs> go, all the genres. <laughs> Checklist. What we'll call. <laughs> awesome. And you, had, you said you had a, another question, Rena? Yeah, I, I have one last question. Um, and it's about the pictures. I remember a while back before, before you got your book published, you were asking... Um, your old Facebook friends for like photographs from when you were younger and stuff. And I thought they were going to be in the book. And I don't know if that was like part of the plan. Cause I know you've been releasing them on social media, like, you know, recently, but I didn't know if, if that was it or if it was for another project or if they got removed from the book or. Um, that's a, that's a great question. Um, actually they were looking for a, a picture for the cover. Um, so if you like, here's a little like fun find. If you Google the book title and then you go to images, you can see a draft of an early cover and it's actually a picture Mm. of me and then like Mm. a background. And that was the original, uh, cover designers work, but then it sort of fell through and then they had to get a new cover designer. And that's where, that's how we ended up here. And right. Mm. Yeah. And John Julio who, you know. The, the beautiful story of her actually finding my house mm-hmm. um, mm. is is intense and weird and like we have a weird <laughs> connection which is we're we're strangers we're complete strangers but we had this like shared experience and then you know she read the book right after she lost her mother mm. so when we talked on the phone after she found my house <laughs> and, and, <laughs> met, and met my tío um, <laughs> she uh, you know she's telling me about her mom and the loss. And she was sharing very intimate details about having to deal with, like, her mother's estate and things like that. Um, and it was through this, like, common loss that we had this connection. And then she – I'd created a folder for for the um, for the press to, like, look at different pictures to see what they could do. And then mm-hmm. she came up with this beautiful cover that has, like, little Easter mm-hmm. eggs in it, right? And so mm-hmm. if you look at the steps – um, like the first little black and white, you can tell the top of it is actually a picture of a bar in Juarez. And then if you go down a little bit more, there's the four of us, my grandma, my mom, my sister and me in one of the steps. Mm-hmm. And then below that, there's a picture um, of my grandfather and my grandmother. And so she mm-hmm. snuck these into the steps, which I thought was just really beautiful and genius. And she understood how the steps were so significant for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's why I'd ask for those pictures. But, I mean, you know, no one mm-hmm. had any. That was the thing. Mm-hmm. Like, so many of them, like, they're like, we moved a whole bunch. I mm-hmm. don't really have pictures. Um, or a lot of them were like, oh, yeah, they're, like, at my mom's house in a garage somewhere. 
Um, and that was weird because when I moved out, my mom was like, you're taking all of your shit. <laughs> so like every time I moved, I had like yearbooks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, oh, my mom never let me leave anything in the garage. Um, so um, I don't know. Maybe there's photos out there of me when I was younger that I don't know like exists, especially mm. during like my grungier era. I don't have a lot of photos of myself. I have like maybe three Hmm. photos Mm -hmm. and like one of them is ripped I don't know I don't think it was my picture I think it was someone else's picture and because I don't rip pictures you know some people do that like I'm not dating that person anymore so dramatic (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah I don't really rip pictures so I don't even know where I got that photo from um but yeah there's they just wanted pictures of me when I was younger to see if they could play Mm. with the cover and 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 do different things but yeah if you google you'll see like an old version and on the cover even I'm like I think I'm like 16 in that picture so, um, yeah, sixteen-year-old Yasmin took a picture that yeah. didn't know she was. She might end up on the cover, but it had a whole different vibe too. you if you see it, it's cool. It's a little bit more punk rock, I think, than, mm. and this does more like honoring my family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This this fits, especially with the, you know, subtitle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect. Um, we mentioned earlier kind of social media, but mm-hmm. for, for the most part, Yasmin Ramirez writes on most social media, except for TikTok. Except, so uh, Twitter. 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 Except for Twitter. Except okay. for Twitter. Yeah. Um, but if you go to my website, all, all of my social media is linked there. So you can just go to yasminramirez.com and all of my social media is like listed and links to, to like the podcast will be on my website as well when Perfect. it's ready. Mm. <laughs> um, and you can even buy the book through my website I don't personally sell it but I have it linked to like you get an unsigned copy if you go through like bookshop and then I have it linked to a local bookstore literary and they have signed copies um and they go through like a Facebook shop so I'm trying to support a local bookstore that ships mm-hmm. yes um, cool. we love doing that, that <laughs> yeah is, that's a very key thing to do yeah yeah so um they have signed copies and you can order it from them and they'll ship it to you Perfect. Are you working on anything else at the moment? Mm, teasers. Yeah, oh, teasers, teasers. and teasers. all the stuff you have to do at EPCC, <laughs> which is not a lot. <laughs> not you know, a lot at all. Yeah. Yeah. So much free time. Um, yeah, I am. In fact, I was trying to finish a draft of a manuscript this summer, and it didn't work out. I just I got stuck, really, really stuck, and I hadn't been that stuck in a long time. But I also hadn't written fiction in quite a while. Mm. Um, and so I forgot that sometimes you just get stuck and you can't figure out the story. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm working on something that's also music-based. Like, it's it's very, very centered in music. It's it's based in El Paso, too, um, about a girl who wants to just, like, be a rock star and make it big. And so um, I keep it, like, in the El Paso High area neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'm just kind of playing with stuff. But it's weird because, you know, writing this, I always had my memory to fall back on. I hadn't, didn't need to fill in a story. Yeah. Sometimes I had to reflect and think, like, what's important about this story? But now I'm, like, really, really, really creating a, a character from scratch. And I have the character, but I'm having her move in different spaces. And I'm like, oh, wait, does that make sense? So I'm mm-hmm. having to really question some of my, my, my attempts at things. And um, I did something I've never done before. I made, like, a wall map of the different chapters Mm -hmm. and I actually found like I skipped an age because it's going like by her different ages and I'm like oh my god how did I forget 10 years old Mm -hmm. um (laughs) so I had to go back and think about like what I could what I could do but I you can tell sometimes what I'm working on because I'll ask people things on on social media Mm -hmm. so one of the things I asked uh because I'm basing one of the chapters in western playland like when it was at Escarate not Mm -hmm. where it is now and I asked, like, what's a song that you remember playing at Western Playland? And I loved that I didn't say oh, where. Yeah. And everyone the, automatically went to mm-hmm. the Himalaya. The Himalaya. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, That's what I was right yes, yeah. everyone who responded <laughs> went there. And I thought that is like, a, it's because it's a shared experience, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was beautiful because I just asked for a song and people kept on giving me the ride and the song. And then it was funny, the songs that they gave me, because I'm like, oh, my God, like, that's hilarious. Yeah, mine is Machine Head. I remember I've been playing Bush, Bush. Machine Head oh on the, the Himalaya. I remember that one for some reason. Right now, do you have one? I don't. I mean, I, I remember the ride, and I remember they were popular songs and songs that you would hear, like, mm-hmm. on KLAQ. So it had to yeah. be a rock song, but I can't think yeah. of it right now. Nice. 
I'm sure it'll come to me like at three in the morning. So what would she <laughs> do to go to Western Playland? Make sure to ask her <laughs> the character of that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Vanessa would not Did eat her a, broccoli. Oh. I would not eat my broccoli. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, go, uh, <laughs> Those of you who know, you know, you know, you know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> fun yeah, wait to ask i know yeah that that's cool yeah i'm hoping now i had to push the date i think it's gonna be december where i'll have like a first draft done um so i'm gonna have to work on saturdays honestly to like get it done mm. um but i have like the chapter with western playland i i had like the brief sketch of it and now something that i do is i'll chew on it mentally a whole bunch and then when i sit down i already have it like mentally written i just have to write it Mm. So I I didn't have that ready. I just started the chapter, and I didn't actually. I didn't go with a rock song. I went with Regulator. Regulator. Yeah. Yeah. Because right, they they. So so what does it mean when <laughs> rhythm is the bass and the bass is the treble? Let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the music theory behind that. Uh, <laughs> you have to ask Warren G. <laughs> yeah. And Nate. And um, Nate. I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I didn't have it. I didn't know what I was going to do. So then I'm like, oh, wait, now I do. Now I, I've figured out what's going to happen and why that chapter is important. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's going to be fun. Uh, each chapter is focused on like a song is featured in a chapter. So the nice. book itself is going to be like a soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Mm. I've been reading a lot of those lately, other than like Funeral for Flacca. But so um, I just read Turn Around Bright Eyes by Robbie... Sheffield? Mm-hmm. Have you read any of his I, stuff? I've read all of his books. Oh, I love um, him. And he's a character in my book. Oh, yeah. my God. Okay, <laughs> he, he's, in the first he's in the first chapter. He's in the first chapter. He doesn't know it, but he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's in the first chapter. He's on Instagram, so just, you know. Yeah, I'm going to tag him. Tag him. and Tag him. And, um, <laughs> yeah, he's interviewing. Uh, the, the, I can give this away. I can talk about this. It's not going to give anything away. Like, Lola's imagining what it's like to be famous. That's the character's name, Lola. And so she's imagining like Rob Shetfield like interviewing her because mm-hmm. she's he's the one who interviews like rock stars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Rides she's like super excited and imagining the whole interview That's so and cool. yeah. That's cool. cool. <laughs> but yes, I'm a big fan of his of his work. Um, and I've been reading awesome. a lot about music too, so that also mm-hmm. helps. Like I just finished the revival of Opal and Nev. That. Uh, it's written like a oral history, and it's pretty mm. cool. I would mm. recommend the audio book. I just posted a video about it. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. But reading about music helps too. Right on. That's that's something that I do. I guess in closing, <laughs> that's something that I've I've seen a lot with authors when when people when they're asked, you know, like, what do you do when you get stuck or mm. um, when you're working through character development or whatever, and like. I read, you know, I read, I read, I read, I get ideas, you know, I get inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I can't help but like, you know, drive that home because I always tell my students too, that, you know, I'm not really a creative writer on the side, but um, <laughs> secretly, <laughs> secretly, <laughs> she's a secret That's writer. That's what I do. She's, <laughs> in, the, she's <laughs> in the closet. She's in the writing closet. Yeah, <laughs> in the closet. That's what I tell my students. They're like, well, I, when I get stuck, just read, you'll get inspired. Something will mm. will spark and and you'll start writing again. You know, right on. that's only temporary. The the stuckness is always temporary. For sure, it is. And I think too, like I don't think I'm going to take anything like because sometimes you'll writing is a lot like cooking in some ways, and that you read a whole bunch of books and you're like, oh, I like how they did this, and I mm-hmm. like how they did this. So you create like your own kind of res- narrative recipe in a different <laughs> form, right? Mm-hmm. And so I don't, I don't write at this point right now. I just finished Opal and Nev like. Uh, a few days ago. I don't think I'm going to take anything from it because I'm not writing oral history. Um, but I did like it anyway. And it, it I liked the way they, that she put music into it. Um, and yeah, it was also like, how can I do this? How can I insert music in a, in a natural way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I read, I've been reading nonfiction too. Like I read uh, The History of the Riot Girls, mm-hmm. right, in the 90s. So mm-hmm. it, even if it's not gonna give you something that you can recipe from it it like parallel it gets you thinking about music mm. in different ways mm. or your topic right so mm-hmm. yeah you have to read for sure if you're trying to write mm-hmm. and you don't read like you're just shooting yourself in the foot yeah. mm-hmm. Absolutely. and with that it's a great way to end it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks for thanks for joining us today thank you <laughs> oh, that was fun
Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, brought to you by Border Census and recorded at Power at the Pass. This episode, we continued our discussion on Andale Prieta, a love letter to my family. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Join us on our next episode and follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep and on Twitter at literallylitep.